Let's close eyes for prayer. You commit yourself to the Lord. That tonight the Lord will speak to your heart. Jesus is all the world to me. My friend, my joy, my all. When I'm sad, it makes me glad. He is all the world to me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your love. I will thank you for your glory that you are pouring upon us. We thank you very much, Lord, for the privilege we have coming before you so you can train us, develop us, mold us into the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray as we come to this session again, you'll fill us with your own fullness in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, your hand will be upon every one of us, young and old, men and women, that, Lord, in your presence, there will be the fullness of joy. Amen. And we'll carry this anointing and this ointment, we'll carry it to the places we came from, and great will be the success, the harvest of the work, evangelism, that we're going to do. Confirm it in our lives, O oh Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We can be seated. We're coming to Matthew chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 1. I'm reading also to verse 6. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth blessed are they which do hunger and thirst at a righteousness, for they shall be filled. As you look at verse 1, and it says, Seeing the multitudes, as it struck you that that word multitude is in the plural, why would you use the word multitude? And we're talking about a congregation here. And say, seeing the multitudes. You understand? As you compare scriptures with scriptures. Like when the 5,000 men, not counting women, not counting children, when they came together. And then he told them to sit down so he could feed them. You will remember, they sat down in different, different groups. Why? Oh, because you need to leave an aisle. A passage in between the whole multitude what happened then is it was a great multitude and then you have a multitude here then a little space a multitude here then a little space you have a multitude here then a little space you have a multitude here and then you have the plural multitude 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 a multitude. Why? Because God is not the author of confusion, but is the author of godliness, orderliness. Why do you need to separate the multitudes and put them separate so that, you know, if we all, for example, if there were no aisle, that is, these long passages that you have in between rows of seats, if there were no passages like that, somebody is hard pressed, he wants to go to the toilet to easily come out of a large crowd. That would distract a lot of attention. But when you have the multitude separated, somebody gets up, he goes where he wants to go. You want to serve them with food, you easily pass by through those aisles and serve them. Or you want to have, it's like when we come for, you know, a Sunday worship service here. Somebody is asking a question. If we were all jam-packed together, 
without any space in between it will be so hard for anybody to come out and say this is my question that's why you have seen the multitudes everything has a reason and as he saw the multitudes he went up into a mountain a mountain and it was just to have an elevation i was talking to one some of our state overseers in november i think that in one of their states i had somebody writing to me from yours from one of your states we're all here now and the fellow wrote to me i don't want to mention the states now but just shows the ignorance he said dear pastor we appreciate you that you keep to the bible and uh, we have been using wooden pulpit before and now you are using glass pulpit we're going away from scripture and therefore pastor come back to the scripture and get rid of those glass pulpit and bring wooden pulpit then he said something i'm telling you how some of you workers how you become so familiar with your pastor with your father in the lord and you forget your father in the lord is still much much higher than you are spiritually and in age as well then he wrote in that letter i said pastor i'm serious about this and then he was serious <laughs> and then he said if you don't correct it i will publish it in the newspapers to get your attention think about a member of your church writing to me like that are you lagos people those of you in lagos when these people come from the states and they see the way you relate with your pastor and the way you belittle your pastor and the way you talk to your pastor and the way you react to your pastor they take it back to their states they think that is the right thing to do that's why somebody a young fellow somewhere can write to me and say the glass pulpit is not right and that if I don't change it, he'll write in the papers. I didn't reply him. Why should I reply him? I have a microphone and I have a gathering. And at my own time, I can speak to everybody. And then if he is there, I hope he'll be intelligent enough to make restitution to his father. And a glass pulpit is still there jesus did not use a wooden pulpit nor a glass pulpit he climbed up to the mountain top shouldn't we all then go back to the mountain top and when we are set on the mountain then we'll be able to preach to the people the idea is not the mountain the idea is not the wooden pulpit the idea is not the glass pulpit the idea is to be elevated higher than the congregation so that you'll be able to see them and see the multitudes he went up into a mountain and when he was said his disciples came unto him his disciples they came unto him we don't force anybody to come those who are disciples will come we don't attract everybody those who are disciples will be attracted we're not compelling everyone come you know sometimes it's when i just want to be you know loving and i go out of my way and i say oh, my friend my brother i've not seen you for some time you've not seen me are you still in this church yes sir i'm seeing the church are you still in this country with us yes i am did you attend the last congress yes i did i've never missed any meeting how come i never see you anymore why are you drawing back uh, we're just trying to be nice but really we shouldn't be saying that those who are disciples will come and the ones that are disciples they are the people that will come if they are drawing back if they are pulling back if they are avoiding us that's all right they are not disciples those who are disciples will come and his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and he touched them and he said blessed are the poor in spirit you know what he was announcing to them he's saying disciples you want to be useful i'm soon going to choose i've not chosen yet i'm soon going to choose 12 out of you and what i will be looking for I'm going to avoid the people that are proud in spirit. I'll just push you aside. That's what he was saying. 
that if you're going to be part of the kingdom, ministers in the kingdom, servants in the kingdom, he was announcing to them, maybe they didn't know, this is what I'll be looking for. Blessed are the poor in spirit, not the proud in spirit. You know, we have some people that have talents, but you, you can't control them. The more talents they have, the more proud they become. And they cannot be useful in the kingdom. But Jesus said, those that are meant for the kingdom, members and ministers in the kingdom, they are those who are poor in spirit, not only that, those who mourn. And sometimes, you know, it's good for me to be here. That is, it's good for this pulpit here to be higher than the congregation. Even when I'm not preaching, and I sit down there, and I run my eyes across the congregation, I can see that sometimes carelessness is funny to some people, and bad things are funny to some people. And it's like it makes them rejoice. They don't mourn. You are disqualified. Because Jesus Christ said, I'm telling you, my disciples, you are nearer here, and you are hearing me, and you are seeing me. Blessed are they that mourn. When something bad happens, those who are not mourning, they make heroes out of villains. They make heroes out of rebellious people. But Jesus said, Blessed are they that mourn. They shall be comforted. And then he said, Blessed are the meek. You know, it's, uh, it's very easy to... Uh, those of you sitting down there, it's very difficult to know whether you're meek or not because you're all sitting down gentle. But you know, uh, those of us that come up here, either we come to preach or we come to sing or we come to do one thing or the other, we're visible, we're known. And you can tell whether somebody is meek or not, whether he's teachable or not. And Jesus said, those who are going to be useful in the kingdom, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Inherit the earth. We're not going to inherit the earth like the politicians inherit. They campaign. And then after they campaign, you vote for them. We don't vote in the church. We well, just look for a simple in spirit. Does he mourn when something bad, sinful happens? Are they meek? Are they lovely? Are they lowly? Are they humble? Are they submissive? Are they without anger? And then it says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst at righteousness, for they shall be filled. We shall be filled. Give me a good amen. amen. I'm talking to you tonight on spiritual fullness and fulfillment. Is it possible to be spiritually full? Yes, it is. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19 and verse 20. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. The possibility is there to be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The possibility is there to be full. Colossians chapter 1 from verse 9. For this cause we also since the day we heard it, do not cease, do not stop to pray for you and to desire that he might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. See what we're talking about? The possibility of being filled with the fullness of God. If it were not possible, the Lord Jesus Christ will not tell us to thirst after something that is a mirage. What's a mirage? If you're traveling in the afternoon on a hot day, a sunny day, no clouds at all, 
and then you look at the road at the stretch of road in front of you when you look ahead like this it's like there's water on the road and then you think maybe there is water nearby and then you might be able to fetch that water to quench your thirst and then you go and when you get to that spot it is dry then you look ahead again and it looks like it's water we call it a mirage and there is a mirage of life like that and there are people that are chasing the wind they're chasing shadows they're chasing mirage but righteousness and the fullness of spiritual blessing is not a mirage it is something real that's why jesus said you hunger and you thirst so that you will be filled blessed are they which hunger and thirst at righteousness for they shall be filled so filled with righteousness that will live in it and influence all around us with that kind of righteousness the righteousness of god this christ-like righteousness is a gateway to full redemption and it's a gateway to spiritual fullness in our lives all we need is to be in christ and for christ to be in us and then we're thirsty and we're hungry for this fullness which will lead to a full and fulfilled life i divide this message to three parts number one hindrances to the promised spiritual fullness hindrances to the promised spiritual fullness point number two hunger and thirst for the promised spiritual fullness hunger and thirst for the promised spiritual fullness number three the hungry and the thirsty satisfied filled and fulfilled the hungry and the thirsty satisfied filled and fulfilled number one hindrances to the promised spiritual fullness in proverbs chapter 27 proverbs chapter 27 verse 7 the full soul loathed and honeycomb but to the hungry every bitter thing is sweet the full soul loathes despises belittles shuns and honeycomb see when the soul is full already you might be filled with the husks that the pigs and the swine are eating but once you are filled up you will loathe you will be little you will shun you will jettison you will reject the honeycomb the thing that the lord wants to give you that will fill your life with joy with happiness and with the favor of god you reject it because you are full when you think do i need anything if before you came to the congress you have been very much conscious of your spiritual leanness and then when you heard on that watch night service fullness fruitfulness and fulfillment if there was a yearning a longing this is what i want then you would have since you came you would have locked up yourself somewhere knocking at the gate of heaven asking the almighty god and telling the lord oh lord this is what my i long for and this is what i'm passionate for but because the full soul despises rejects jettisons belittles even the honeycomb the good things of the kingdom and what the lord wants to do it's like they're not important to those people that is a hindrance that will not allow you to have the fullness that the lord is promised in revelation chapter 3 revelation chapter 3 reading from verse 17 because thou sayest i am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched 
and miserable and poor and blind and naked. When a person does not know the true spiritual state in which he is in, in which he is, or in which she is, and he feels, I am rich. Ah, in fact, this past year, I've never been as spiritual like that in my life. I felt great. And yet the Lord is looking down, saying, if you knew your condition, if you knew heaven's evaluation about you, and about your ministry you'll fall on your knees and you'll cry for the fullness of the lord you see this is what hinders our spiritual fullness because thou sayest i am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing why pray i have need of nothing why search i have need of nothing why thirst why hunger i have need of nothing why knock at the gate of heaven i have need of nothing when you're in that situation it's a hindrance for you to be able to have the fullness of the lord because you do not know that in the sight of god spiritually you're wretched you're miserable you're poor you're blind and naked what a great hindrance mark chapter 4 Mark chapter 4, verse 19. Hindrances to the promised spiritual fullness. Verse 19. And the cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches. And the lusts of other things. Entering in, choke the world. And it becometh unfruitful. The cares of this life, of this world. What are we going to eat? Are we going to match the Joneses running after the people of the world? They've got it. We must get it. The cares of this world, holding two jobs together at the same time, running to a particular office and then in the evening hours, running for another job again. The cares of this life. And they're doing some ceremonies, some function in my village. I must be there and I must spend. I must get involved. Even though I am a Christian, I cannot separate myself from the social life of my village people, the cares of this life. And you are so much involved, some of you, with the people of this world and the social events of this world, that your spiritual thirst is gone and the spiritual hunger is gone. Marriage, naming ceremony, burial, you know, somebody bought a car, somebody built a house. From celebration to celebration, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. What does that mean? I'm not happy because I don't have money. I think if I have money, I'll be happy. Deceitfulness of riches. I'm not happy because I don't know people. If I know the people, highly placed people of this world, and I have contacts, I think I'll be happy. The deceitfulness of riches. That's deception. Why do rich people, why do they commit suicide? Money doesn't make them happy. And why do people that are positioned in this world, why do they just give up and do they just run away from society? Because the position, the place, the privilege has not given them happiness. But you see, the deceitfulness of riches and the lost inordinate desire for all the things entering in. They were not there when you were born again. They were not there when you became a minister. They were not there when you became a child of God. Even when you became a worker in the church. All those things were not there. The lost of all the things entering in. This uh, past year, we had um, a kind of surprising experience. I don't know what to call it. Surprising experience. We wanted to help the language churches to grow and develop. And so we said we're going to have, uh, you know, the regional overseer for language, regional overseer for English, and come and see the politics. And come and see the struggling and the fighting. I mean fighting. Come and see the use of bad words from the language people to the English people. And come and see the struggle and the campaign and the politics that came in. And I had it from one stage 
I said, that state must be peculiar. Why are they acting like that? I want to help them. And we have overseer here, overseer there. And I said, you divide your assets. I want to evangelize, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The struggle was too much. My brother just uh, finished preaching now. Um, Sam, is it? This is my brother. I'd been a region overseer for a long time in his own region. And he, he trained all those people. After he trained them, and we had all these workers and everybody, and, you know, people respect him in the stage. And then we now said, we're going to divide. You'll be surprised. One of the people he had raised up that became a language, a language, a region of a seer, had more members than him in the English section. I said, so my brother, what's the matter here? Here's your boy. That just uh, became region of a cell language. How is it? And you know, in his characteristic way, just when I said, Well, Pastor, you know, these young people, leave them in. He never says any bad thing about anybody. It's since I knew him. He just said, Pastor, no problem. That we will walk again and bring up the English church. And then I said, Okay, my brother, go and sit down. And then uh, after that, then I confronted another, another region of a seer, English. And in the same struggle, I thought it was only in their stage. And then I encountered other people in other states. I had the story here. I had the story here. And understand, if I have a vision, and I put down the vision, and I say, let's run with it. I had a planning meeting here. When we had a planning meeting, and the overseers were telling me, the state overseers they were saying, Pastor, uh, this, the way we want to do it, these people will know them. I said, no, we will do it. There is vision. And then I spoke and I convinced everybody. They said, Pastor, you are the leader. We just gave an idea. And then we stopped at that. And then we established everywhere, north, south, everywhere, language region of Asia, English region of Asia, and come and hear. The laws for other things. Position. Eventually. Would you know that we have cancelled it? And before I can cancel a vision that I believe God gave me, you must know that it really was bad. I, don't, I felt if everybody is backsliding because of position and because I have vision, why am I going to, you know, be stubborn about the vision? Why should I say by force, by force, we must have vision, whether people break their heads or not, whether they lose all the experiences they have got or not, the desire for other things entering in that was not there before. That's why we don't have the fullness of God. But if during this Congress, you can come aside and wait upon the Lord and all these desires for other things, you abandon them and you say lord what we need is the fullness of the lord the lord will bring us back again Amen. it says when they enter in they choke the world they choke the world and becometh unfruitful that's the reason why some people do not have what they ought to have we're revealing them so that the devil will not cheat us anymore and we are going to have the victory in Jesus' name. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. Now ye are full. Now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us. Uh, Paul the apostle was talking to the Corinthians. But he was talking in an ironic way. You need to understand when you read the scriptures. Paul the apostle was the one that preached to them. Everything they knew at Corinth, they knew through Paul the apostle. That's why he told them, he said, Corinthians, do you have any other father? You may have 10,000 teachers, but you have just one father. And then they became so proud, uncontrollable, and Paul the apostle couldn't even reach them again. And then Paul said, in an ironic manner, now Corinthians, ye are full. You Corinthians, now you are rich. Now you reign as kings without us. Corinthians, can you think of reigning without your father, without Paul? Who has been to the third heaven 
Now you reign without us. Then he said, I would to God. He did reign. Now you understand. He's saying, I would to God. I really pray that the real reigning you will have. Then he said, that we also might train with you. If you run ahead of us, and you think you've got the baton, and you've got everything, now you can reign with, for, without us. It doesn't work. Why don't you come back? If you're going to reign at all, it has to be with us. Win, win, situation. Not win, lose, situation. Not put your father down so you can come up. Not put your overseer down so that you can come up. It's a win-win situation. Not a lose-win situation. That others may lose and I would win. What kind of reigning is that? I wish he would reign in reality. You see, this is why they didn't have the fullness that they ought to have. And you are looking at Genesis chapter 33 verse 9. Genesis chapter 33 looking at verse 9 and here is the language of Esau and Esau said I have enough my brother keep that thou hast unto thyself Esau was talking to Jacob Jacob actually was trying to make a form of restitution to restore unto him because he knew he had cheated him now he had prayed and God had forgiven him and he felt for us to reconcile together. Let me give part of the blessing the Lord has given me. Let me give it to Esau to make amends for my cheating him. And then he said, my brother Esau, would you take this from me? And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. That's why some people don't have what they ought to have. I pray that we will have what we ought to have. Self-satisfaction is one of the great hindrances to spiritual progress and spiritual fullness. So also are ignorance, material prosperity, suffering. What I mean by that is when somebody is sick, it appears the only thing he can think about is his physical condition. The pain that he's going through. And then to concentrate on spiritual matters becomes very, very difficult. Or sometimes the search for earthly knowledge. And distractions of all kinds. Whatever quenches our spiritual thirst hinders our spiritual fullness. Whatever quenches our spiritual thirst also hinders our spiritual fullness. I pray all these hindrances, they'll be taken away. And real thirst and real hunger will be in us. Point number two. Hunger and thirst for the promised spiritual fullness. Hunger and thirst for the promised spiritual fullness. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger and thirst. All you actually desire and earnestly seek God will find him. Earnestness in seeking God, fervency in praying to the Lord for His promised fullness will always be rewarded. That's why you need to seek and find Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62, reading from verse 1 For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. That's desire. That's thirst. That's passion. 
that's seeking for something, saying, I'm not going to rest. I'm not going to hold my peace until the righteousness of the city of our God shines forth and goes forth. And the salvation thereof will burn like a lamb. And the Gentiles in verse 2 shall see that righteousness. All the kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name. Which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory. In the hand of the Lord. And a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Verse 7, and give him no rest, give him no rest, till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. You see, that's how to have the fullness of God. You are knocking all the time, you are importunate, you are praying all the time, praying without ceasing, until it actually happens. Psalm 62. Psalm 62, reading from verse 1. In Psalm 62, verse 1, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. My soul waiteth upon God. I'm leaning upon God. I'm resting upon God. I'm very patient in prayer in the presence of my God. My soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. It tells us in verse 5, that same psalm, my soul, my soul, wait thou upon God. For my expectation is from him. See what that is telling us. If we're going to have the promised spiritual fullness, it says, my soul is like talking to himself. Do you sometimes talk to yourself? You know, sometimes you sit down in the house and there's Bible to read. There are, there are books to read. I don't know what you do, how you do your own, but I know how I do my own. Let me not talk about my own because that may look too high for you. But as a Christian and as a minister, I, I, have you ever thought about picking a very important book and then saying at least I will finish a book in one month and stick with it and stay with it have you ever thought about picking a series of cases that you have listened to maybe on the Holy Ghost maybe on the fullness of God and just stick to it and say this month I'm going to listen to this series over and over until the fullness in these cases series of messages until they are translated into me have you ever done that waiting upon the lord my soul waits thou only upon god for my expectation is from him he only is my rock and my salvation he is my defense i shall not be moved in God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength. My refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times. That's how to have the fullness, the hunger, the thirst, the passion, the desire. Trust in Him at all times. Ye people, pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Lamentation chapter 3. In Lamentation chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 49. Lamentation chapter 3, verse 49. Mine eyes trickleth down and ceases not without any intermission till the Lord look down and behold from heaven. It says, My eyes are pouring down tears i'm mourning for my dryness my weariness i see the lack and the limitation in my ministry and because of that my eyes trickle down and then it says it's without intermission that is without any interruption until the lord will look down and it will behold from heaven and do something that is passion and that is how to have the spiritual fullness that the lord has promised us 
Now, you are wondering, Paul the Apostle, how is it he became converted after all those other apostles? And then he went beyond all of them. Do you know what happened at the time he became born again? He met the Lord on the road to Damascus. Do you know what happened immediately after? Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Verse 8. And Saul arose from the earth. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But he led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight. And neither did eat nor drink. Neither did eat nor drink. Three days. He just met the Lord. A great encounter. A great vision. A great revelation. He was knocked down by that, tre that revelation. And then he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? All right, go to Damascus. It will be revealed to you what you will do. When he got there, he didn't plan before that was not going to eat. That was going to fast. He didn't know he would meet the Lord. This is sudden experience. And when he got to Damascus for three days and three nights, he will not eat. He will not eat. He wanted to know the reason for this call. The purpose of this call. The goal of this call. The destination of this call. And the impact of this call upon his life. And because of that three days, without planning it ahead of time, he was fasting. And then we're told in verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed like he never prayed in his life before. He just met Jesus. And for those three days, he was praying. Talking about praying for five minutes. Talk, talking about praying for 15 minutes. Nothing. Talking about praying for one hour. That was nothing. For three days, stretch. At a stretch, he was praying, bombarding heaven. Lord, do I still have much chance left? Have I not used all my energy in the wrong way? Have I not gone the wrong direction? And now you are calling me. What will I do? Because all these Christians are imprisoning them. And how am I going to go back now and be telling them, I met the Lord. What are you going to do with me? And the apostles, will they accept me? The church, will they accept me? What will I do? Will I just become a sweeper? Or a gate man? Or a doormat? What will I do? What are you going to show me? All my wisdom, all my education, all the high, high qualification. Does it have any use in the kingdom of God? I heard, because I've been following them, that the greatest of those of your servants, the fishermen, Lord, I'm not a fisherman. I am a kind of, I'm a walking library. I know Greek. I know Hebrew, and I know all the traditions of the elders, and I know the people on top. These people, they know nothing. Am I going to lie down under them, and then whatever they allow me to do, I will do? They will not understand my Greek. They will not understand my Hebrew. Oh Lord, what will I do? Three days, he was praying. That's why God used him. If we're going to have the fullness of God, you wage upon the Lord and then you bombard heaven. Not this kind of, you know, Congress. Congress, after we are preached for one hour or one and a half hours, and then we cannot pray. And it's Congress. To have the fullness of God, we need to come on our knees or standing on our feet before the Lord and say, Lord, this is Congress. If I didn't get it at the retreat, if I didn't get it at the workers retreat, if I miss it at the congress, when would I ever have the fullness? That is the kind of heart 
the kind of attitude that the Lord blesses abundantly. He's talking about being importunate in prayer in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, reading from verse 5. Luke 11 verse 5. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say, Unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, because of praying without ceasing, because of asking without giving up, because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. I say unto you, ask in that way it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto all. Everyone that asketh receiveth. What a revelation. If we have not received, we have not been asking right. We have not been asking with all our heart, all our soul, all our passion. Everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that say, Father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If then, if he then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? The fullness will come when we ask the Lord, when we're importunate in prayer, when we're serious and determined in prayer. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. All through to verse 31. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. Now, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faith. And to them that have no might, increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall but they that wait upon the lord they that wait upon the lord we know it but it's something to know it it's another thing to practice it it's one thing to preach it it's another thing to practice age you know sometimes uh, when you understand the bible you sometimes will come into conflict with those who don't understand the bible and because of my understanding of the bible that's why sometimes i say things that will make your head almost a turn if i tell you that in the new testament in the early church there was no separated small group of prayer warriors. The whole church, they, they prayed like, like prayer warriors. Not that a small group, a church of 500, then 20 people will go apart and say they are prayer warriors. All the 500 will pray. Are we releasing the rest of the people? Now you don't have to pray. We are prayer warriors. Where is that in the New Testament? And among the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Were there special prayer warriors? No, sir. All of them were told you pray and you do not fade. And Paul the Apostle said in 1 Thessalonians to all the believers, pray without ceasing. They that wait upon the Lord. Is somebody going to do your praying for you? Somebody is going to do your waiting upon the Lord for you. Somebody is going to do reading the Bible for you. Somebody is going to do worship, praising the Lord for you. In the New Testament, the whole church came together and they prayed unto the Lord. And the place was shaking where they were praying. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. But you know the church of today, we have to, you know, bring some few people apart. And those few people think that, you know, they are the people to pray revival into the church. It never happens that way. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The Lord is telling us that we need to pray and we will pray. And when you pray, the might of the Lord, the power of the Lord, the spiritual dynamite coming from the throne of God will enter into you and saturate your life. Every yoke will be broken in Jesus' name. And then the key of faith, the Lord has put in your hand, you'll be able to use that key. Number three, the hungry and the thirsty, satisfied, filled, and fulfilled. The hungry and the thirsty, satisfied, filled, and fulfilled. Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled satisfied filled fulfilled if you are hungry hungry for the Lord hungry for the fullness spiritual fullness promised by the Lord I can assure you this Congress was arranged because of you and that fullness will come you take all the hindrances away all the things you did before that didn't allow you you missed your chance you missed your opportunity you missed the favor the favor of God and the favor of man you missed it you know, we need favor from God. We need favor from man. No time for me to tell you. We need favor from God. We need favor from man. Here comes Jacob. He knew. I need favor from God. I need favor from Isaac, my father. He got it the wrong way. But he had it. Favor. Favor from man. Here comes Elisha. We need favor from God. We need favor from man. Elijah. Here comes David unto Samuel, or Samuel unto David. Yes, we know the anointing is coming from God. The infilling, indwelling is coming from God. We need favor from God. We need favor from man. You see, when you put yourself in such a place that the fullness of God can pass through, the man God has appointed. To fill you with his fullness. But what else do you want? That God himself will pour himself into you. But you know, if we are backing one another. If it appears we are struggling. And, and really we are not struggling. I was, how can we be struggling? You, you, don't, you don't want to. You are not struggling with my place. When I am to preach, you allow me to preach. When it's your turn, I allow you to do yours. I don't disturb you. I'm not sure you want to disturb me. We have separate ministries. We have separate callings. I fulfill my calling and bless you. You fulfill your calling and bless me. And as the right hand will wash the left hand, and the left will wash the right, then both hands will be clean. 
But if the right hand and the left hand, if they back one another, wash yourself. I wash myself. And you minister to yourself, I minister to myself. We're not going to have the fullness. When there's cooperation. And then the, the both hands are washing one another. In no time at all, we'll be clean. In no time at all, see, these hands, raise up your hands and let me see. Anointed, empowered, you will lay these hands on the sick and they shall recover. Yeah. Why? What are we looking for? What are we looking for? You come to a place like this. For about, uh, since I came from AKT stage, after the retreat, I locked myself up. Well, not if I, maybe I went to Bagada once or twice because of Bible study. Just preparing, preparing, preparing because I knew that we're coming for Congress. And a person that prepares himself and he says, I just want to dump all these things on the people. And then we come here and we don't allow the right hand to wash the left and the left to wash the right. And there's somebody there that says, you know, what are we struggling about? Are we in the same class? Am I, am I trying to write the same exam with you? Are we comparing notes? Are we sitting side by side? You sit on your bench. I sit on my chair. And let's do this work. And let's pour this thing upon you. That by the grace of God, the infilling of power will come upon you in Jesus' name. Yeah. And that's what the word of God is saying. And some of you, it's like even the more we say it. The more you still want to demonstrate your hardness of heart. And you came here not to receive. But as we come before the Lord and we say, yes, Lord, here am I. I want something from you. Do you want something? Yeah. They're hungry and they're thirsty. Satisfied, filled and fulfilled. Psalm 72. In Psalm 72, Reading from verse 6. It shall come down like rain upon the moon grass as showers that water the earth. In its days shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth Jeremiah chapter 23 Jeremiah chapter 23 I'm reading from verse 5 Behold the days come says the Lord that I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth in his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. I pray he will fill you. Sephaniah chapter 3. Sephaniah chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 13. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. I need an amen. amen. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all their heart. O daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away thy judgments. He has cast out thine enemy. The King of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt see, thou shalt not see evil anymore. You see, when you come near to the Lord and you wait upon the Lord, that's the fullness He wants to give. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9. For the fruit of the Spirit 
is in all goodness and righteousness and truth then verse 18 and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess but be filled with the spirit be filled with the spirit john chapter 7 john chapter 7 verse 37 in the last day that great day of the feast jesus stood and cried saying if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink he that believeth on me as the scripture has said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water if any man thirst uh, you cannot force clean cool cold nourishing water on somebody who is not thirsty if any man thirst let him come it's you that will show it your thirst it's you that will come unto the lord it's you that will come to and say lord i need something i am here for the spiritual fullness let him come unto me and drink he that believeth on me as the scripture has said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water but they spake he of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive for the holy ghost was not yet given because that jesus was not yet glorified at that time now the lord is glorified and now the fullness is available i said the fullness is available and blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for they shall be filled it's now your turn i've spoken to you you are not to take those words and take those words to the heavenly father lord i am hungry lord i am thirsty i come to be filled rise up and talk to the lord in prayer because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to stay out of the I just thank God for all his provisions. I just blessed him with grace.